morning. morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. How good it is we can gather to worship God, to to celebrate right here at Quispam United. And if you're joining us on Zoom, how good you can be with us through the wonder of that technology as well. Uh, I'm always amazed that the the latest best uh, or most often used phrase is you're muted. So if you're on Zoom and you want to unmute so we can hear you singing, that would be delightful. Thank you. But we gather here in the presence of God this Thanksgiving Sunday and we're reminded of the light of Christ that continues to, to shine brightly even as the, the days get shorter and the nights get longer. We're reminded that the light of Christ is with us to sustain us and to guide us to be a beacon when we are lost and a sign of hope when we are found. So we gather celebrating this Thanksgiving Sunday. I'm... Welcome to Quispam Cis United Church on this beautiful Thanksgiving morning. As part of our welcome, we light this candle, lit from the flame of Christ's own light and love, as we proclaim ourselves as a community where all people are invited, without barriers based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, differing abilities, 
ethnic background, or economic circumstance. We celebrate the richness that diversity brings to our church, even as it challenges us to walk down roads we have not yet traveled. We pray for God's spirit to guide us as we work for reconciliation and justice for all persons in both church and society. The Acknowledgement of Territories. As we gather to worship, let us pause to remember that in this region, we live and work and worship on lands that are, by law, the unceded territories of the Wabanaki peoples, predominantly the lands of the Mi'kmaq, Wulistikwe, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. Growing up, and uh, uh, he would put the turkey in in the morning. Uh, there were usually, normally seven of us around the table, but that's just how many were in my family. And if the minister got too long-winded, then the turkey was going to be overdone. So <laughs> let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so, any other celebrations? Freely. Okay. Well, I'm going to celebrate being here. Uh, this is my second Sunday at, at Quiz Pam, and and thank you for that leap of faith. Uh, I uh, it it may take me an, another few Sundays to sort of get the rhythm of things, uh, but that's that's fine. It's it, I'm delighted and honored to to be. Uh, walking with you in this time and uh, another celebration a friend and colleague alice Fillmore's here i might say the reverend alice um, she was the, in ministry in in the prince william pastoral charge which is lake george prince william and, and nakawick uh, and i spent uh, about a dozen years up in that territory as well so oh i just got louder so um so good to have you here and i think your family's uh, on zoom uh unmuted so we'll hear them sing. Okay. I'm just waiting for the screen to change to tell me what to do next. <laughs> You're, I'm the one? Yeah. You're the one. You're the one. <laughs> I'm the other. You're not the one. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but I'll be the one for here. Give thanks. We give thanks for the harvest. Give thanks. We give thanks for the blessings of family and friends. Give thanks. We give thanks for the blessings of our faith, for Jesus the Christ, and the freedom to share these blessings to those in our family, our church community, and the world. Give thanks. So let's let's pray together. Mighty God or what mighty praise belongs to you, O God, for your acts of love and faithfulness toward us. In your mercy, you hear our prayers. You forgive our sins. You provide for our needs. From one end of the earth to the other, you inspire worship and praise. Even nature celebrates your goodness. We too would offer our praise and thanksgiving for your mercy and faithful love toward us. Receive our adoration and our confession, our thanksgiving through the power of your Holy Spirit. Make your presence known among us that we may hear your word and know your will. Open us to giving thanks in this time of thanksgiving. Amen. We're going to
going to sing we praise thee O god it's the words are here but do you have hymn books out there a lot of these hymns have really good harmonies just saying and it's 218. <laughs> would call us to a mind and spirit of of confession gracious creator you have given us so much but too often we take those gifts for granted or as something to which we are entitled you call us to live in caring community but too often we place our wants and needs first with those of others a distant second you call us to share your gifts with the world around us, but we are worried that there may not be enough and our worrying gets in the way of our sharing. For all the times when we mistreat and misuse your gifts, for all the times we assume that we get what we have by ourselves, forgive us and lead us back to the path of wisdom. God is a gracious giver. God is gracious in forgiveness. God calls us to new patterns and new life. We are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. A story about Charlie. Charlie was just a fairly young boy, maybe 10 or 12, and he had a younger sister, Courtney, and Charlie had everything he wanted. He had his favorite cereal for breakfast, 
And perhaps you have a favorite cereal for breakfast that's not called Quaker Oats. <laughs> he could have whatever station he wanted on the TV or whatever he wanted to stream on TV because he had his own TV with all the gizmos and gadgets. He lived in a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood. Charlie had everything he could possibly want. One day he was sitting outside and it was a beautiful fall day and his friend Trevor came along and said, hi, Charlie, how come you don't look very happy? Because even though Charlie had everything he wanted, Charlie just wasn't very happy. And so Trevor sat with Charlie and they looked around the neighborhood and, and finally Trevor said, you know, do you have a happiness coat? And Charlie said, a happiness coat? No, what's a happiness coat? Well, a happiness coat is, is when, you, when you put it on, your mind all of a sudden starts to go to all kinds of happy things in your life. And Charlie, oh, I don't have one of those. And perhaps when you're a 10 or 11 year boy, a, a happiness coat is kind of like the adult version of that really comfy fall sweater you get to take out. It's soft and it's, it just sort of surrounds you with a great big old hug. And so Trevor said, you know, there's one, but I lost it. So why don't we, you help me look around for it. So Trevor and Charlie started looking and they, they looked around the hedges and they, they looked out in the backyard, they looked in the front yard and, and finally they heard a commotion. And so they went and looked and in, in this grand old oak tree that was in their yard, there was this magnificent coat hanging. It was every color imaginable. It was like the whole rainbow and then some. And Trevor, oh, there it is. So they got it down and Trevor helped Charlie put it on. And then Charlie kind of looked up and said, thank you, Trevor, for helping put the coat on me. I feel better already. Oh, and look at the colors of the tree. How wonderful is that? Oh, and, and there's a chipmunk. And I, I don't know what that bird is called, but it's awfully pretty. And all of a sudden, Charlie began to have all kinds of thoughts that made him happy and happier and happier. And all of a sudden, Charlie began to smile. He began to smile because he could feel this happiness percolating up inside him. So I'm wondering, Charlie had a friend, Trevor, to help him with his happiness coat. And if you're in the back seat and you're going to be drawing, I think there's uh, coat pictures there. Uh, so if you want to draw what your happiness coat might look like, that would be wonderful. You can show it to me afterward. But what does your happiness coat look like when you sort of put it on and you go, ah, and then you start to see the world a little bit differently? So from there to, because we're getting to know each other, fun facts about John. And I'll give you a chance to ask me a couple questions. Um, but one thing you may not know, uh, except for today, uh, I like really colorful socks. And I have liturgically correct shoelaces. <laughs> so if you noticed last week, if you were really attentive and looked at shoelaces, they would have been what color? Green. Last, we're in the season of Pentecost until, until Advent starts. So it's, it's green. It's all green. So I have liturgically correct shoelaces in, in the shoes, except for today. These, these ones don't have shoelaces. So, um, Any questions you're curious about, John? You're not curious about anything. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so everything will be a surprise. So, so thank you. That you can, we'll sort of pick those things up along the way. And, and I'll be downstairs for coffee 
and and I think there's probably some cookies there too. Um, so if you have any questions at that point, just simply ask away. Um, but just a reminder, as we're getting there, the Quakers are uh, in the room just down the hallway here, and they they like quiet. So we, we can chat here, and then once we get downstairs, we can chat some more. But along the way, it might be uh, good to be quiet. <laughs> The scripture today is taken from Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus was sit setting out on a journey, a man ran, ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Thank you. Okay. Now I have a question for you. If I was down south, I could say, all y'all, I have a question for you. Do you clap here? Yes, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> just, just wondering. The... <laughs> you raise your hand sometimes too. Okay. Yeah. Clapping can take many forms for all kinds of folks. So, uh, yep, that works. And uh, so, just, just curious. It's, it's, it's not always uh, polite, if you will. So, well, let's pray. We have heard your word this morning and pray that our hearts and ears and minds tingle with what that word has to offer us this day. So may your spirit open us to all of the possibilities and may that same spirit be upon this your servant. Let these words be in keeping with your will. Amen. It's gone now, but that's a tough reading. Living into the balance of eternal life and life today can be daunting. It can be exhausting. It can fill us with all kinds of, of odd questions. And it can leave us perplexed. Not very many people can live into this duality of, of living into eternal life and living in today. But Jesus was able to do that in a delightful and interesting way. And he seemed to do it with relative ease. <clears throat> when Jesus was first calling disciples, and then he called the collection of those who were the first followers, they often struggled with the notion of the teachings of Jesus that they were hearing for the first time. Things like eternal life. And not so much focusing on today, but focusing on the eternal part of our living. Focusing on others and not so much on ourselves. And what do we do with this whole concept of this desire to be wealthy and live a life of ease when Jesus says to give it all away? So this man came to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to eternal life? What does the law say? That was the standard. What does the law of Moses say? And for most of the people who would hear Jesus, they were primarily a Jewish audience, at least at the beginning. What did Moses say about all that? And the, this man recited it all off. Here's all the laws that I have to follow. So I'm curious, anyone know how many laws there are in Torah that the good and faithful Jews must follow? Yeah, you're not even going to come close to a guess, I'm thinking. 613. 613 rules and laws you have to follow. That's a very long list. But I do all that, said this, this man. And Jesus said, great, I'll tell you what, here's another one. Go and sell everything that you have and give away the money. And here the realm of God and ego of humanity collide. And it, the result is usually a mess. Scholars and theologians and preachers have been trying to make this text palatable to digest. Now, Jesus makes this interesting statement that said, oh, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But thanks to dear old Google, you know how many eyes of the needle there are? Well, there's a, whole, there's, there's a variety of them. For some of you who perhaps know Alberta, 
You might know where Sylvan Lake is. Well, there's the Iva Needle in Sylvan's Lake. Who knew? I spent time in Alberta and I didn't know that. I've even been to Sylvan Lake. Did you know there's one in Yorkshire, England? Now, Jesus probably wasn't referring to those ones. He was probably referring to the ancient stone arch through which a loaded camel would have to travel in order to not be overburdened. Yes, exactly like our contemporary way scales for trucks so they don't ruin our roads. But I am sure that Jesus wasn't talking about camels going through the eyes of needles. He was referring to the stuff, the stuff that keeps us from truly being available to walk the way Jesus offers. When Jesus called the first disciples, the account says that the disciples dropped whatever they were doing and followed. There weren't a lot of questions. There wasn't a, a, a test. There wasn't a screening process. They just followed. Now, we're not sure what happened when they had the opportunity to go home and broke news to family and friends that, hey, guess what, Mom? I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm not going to do this anymore. I suspect some were delighted and some were angry. And Jesus recognizes in this text that for some, giving up family and wealth and position will be challenging not only for them, but for their family and for the community. There's a story, and uh, the first disciples Jesus called were Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and they were fishing. You're probably all familiar with that story. And James and John were fishing with their father Zebedee. And Jesus says, follow you, follow me, and I will make you fishers. And they left. Well, I always thought that Zebedee was standing on the shore by this boat filled with fish, angry. And I happened to fall in, really fall in love with this. It's a, it's a made-for-TV series. It's called The Chosen. You're going to hear more about that later, but not right now. And in that, there's this scene. When James and John perhaps make a first few steps to follow Jesus, and they turn around and they go back to their dad, Zebedee, and they go, what, what about all the work you have to do? And Zebedee says, Something like, the one we have been waiting for our entire lives and for generations of lives just called you to follow. And you're worried about what I'm going to tell your email when you're late for supper? Go, follow the Messiah. And throughout the rest of it, Zebedee is enthusiastic that his boys were called by the Messiah to follow. So Jesus is calling us to follow, and it's, it's still difficult, and it's still fraught with danger. But it's different than the first followers. We have a couple of thousand years' experience to, to, to back ourselves up on. Now, it's not all pretty and good, but we have that experience. We are called to live out our belief and our faith all the time. When it's easy, like when we're gathered here, it's really easy to live out our faith when we're, we're sitting here with, with folks who are our family and friends, and when it's difficult, when we go about our daily routines and engage in society. I'm gonna take a little detour this is a John story, by the way, so you'll learn a little bit more about me. Um, many years ago, many, many years ago, uh, I was studying urban planning and economics at St. Mary's University in Halifax. That was my plan. 
And along with a couple of colleagues or friends in, in school, I was, we were all going to Queen's University to do master planning. Uh, that was the plan. One day I was driving home. I was through most of my undergrad work. I was, I was, I was living at home. It was just easier. Uh, I got to drive my parents' car and, and all I had to do was put gas in it. But uh, that's way back when gas was measured in gallons. And, you know, if you had 40 cents, you could at least get, you know, 3.78 liters of gas. I stopped at my home church, which happens to be Knox United in Lower Sackville and Reverend Gordon Ken was the minister at the time. And I just walked in, he was there. I said, Gordon, can I talk to you? He goes, yep, come on in. I said, something tells me I'm being called to ministry and I want you to talk me out of it. <laughs> um, Gordon uh, was, was a really good friend and I, I, could just, I usually just called him Gordon and, and his, his girls were my age. And, uh, so, and I knew how hard it was because I spent time with, with Gordon and his family. But I want you to talk me out of it. And he just looked at me and said, it's about time you figured that out, because a lot of other people have already figured it out for you. And I said, I'm in trouble, aren't I? He said, yep. So we chatted for a couple hours. And so then I went home. It wasn't that far to get home. I grew up on a Beaver Bank Road back, back when it was rural. Uh, and I don't know what you do or what you did do when you had to tell your parents really different news than what they might be expecting. Um, I just tend to blurt it out, so get it over with, like tearing a Band-Aid off fast. So I came in. There was nobody home except my mom. She was working in... Uh, a, bedroom that was converted to a, a, a study because my sisters had all moved out. And so I walked in and I said, hi, mom. And she turned around. You're going into ministry, aren't you? Gordon wasn't supposed to say anything. I knew. And I knew it was today. <sighs> wow. That was a very long time ago. Uh, almost 45 years ago, I think. That's how it started on this particular journey for me. It might seem a little bit Pollyanna to believe that love can make a difference, but it does. For me, it was Gordon and that whole Knox family. It was my mom and then my dad, who was oddly supportive, because, you know, he grew up a rather disgruntled French Catholic, and uh, it was easy to say that. But love does make a difference, and in the story we have today, Jesus looks at this man. Not only just looks at him, but it says, loved him and said. Continue to follow. Go and look toward the kingdom of God. That is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to walk a path where you see each other first with eyes of love and compassion. That was a big challenge for that guy. And he wasn't able to do it, at least not then. We don't know what happened. We don't know the rest of the story. But what would happen in our day if we greet those along the way with love instead of judgment? What might be the outcome if we met the stranger, the refugee, the homeless, the first peoples of this land, our neighbors, each other, with love? We may have to bear others turning and walking away. Heaven's sakes, Jesus experienced that a lot. But we will know in that moment, we showed up without a gender or ego, 
we showed up with just love. For me, that is enough. And the rest, I can depend on God and Spirit to weave their delightful wonder into the outcomes. I have a feeling that is what happened many, many years ago, centuries ago, when those who first lived on this land saw strange-looking boats with even more oddly dressed people arrive on their shores. I expect communication was challenging and difficult, but the need of the stranger was evident. So they were welcomed and sheltered and fed. Those days turned into an annual celebration of thanksgiving. Centuries later, we have folks arriving, looking and speaking differently than us. And we see need for welcome, for shelter, for hospitality, for food. And we do our best. My prayer as we journey into today and this week is that our thanksgiving may also be an opportunity to give thanks. Amen. going to join and sing. This is another one with, I think, some pretty good harmonies. I have to look over my glasses. Uh, come, you thankful people, come, and it's 516 in our Voices United. Are there any announcements and things we need to have come before us? Sure.
Good morning, everyone. Am I on, please? So on uh, the 15th, uh, Reverend John is going to be doing a service in Shannox. I am. Um, most of you know that we've been serving um, the Shannox uh, Parkland Junior Valley community now for uh, decades, and um, we do a service there once every two months. And Reverend John will be presiding. Uh, if you are able to join him and sing and uh, and play with him and bless the people, be there for 115 at the Concord Building. If you look online, there is a map of uh, Parkland in the Valley, Shannox, and you'll see which is Concord. And then you walk through with him to Embassy. So the services are at 1.30 and then again at 2, so two services. Yes, indeed. And I'll bring the toys so we can play together. <laughs> I'm going to try and play the piano, just saying. And do you know if there's music there, or do I have to bring my own? Um, no, you bring okay. Might have to bring my own piano, too, but you never know. Anything else? Because no one's listening to me this last decade, uh, we're going back to standard time on November the 3rd. Um, just saying, this is, I think this is the embarrassing one where you show up for the last hymn. Uh, if you miss it, so uh, but that's coming up in, for that, uh, that, that Sunday. Okay. give you thanks, God, that we are able to share, share of our time and our resources and our gifts. So we pray you to receive these gifts, that they would be used for the benefit of your realm here on earth, that we can feed the poor, tend to the lonely, and be with those who are imprisoned and in hospital. For all of your gifts and our gifts, we give you thanks. Amen. Okay. As we gather in prayer, and I, I, I'll put glasses on when I come to this because it's uh, my arms are short. But uh, I apologize for any names I mispronounce. Uh, you can correct me, please, after work. Um, let's pray. Holy are you, God, and wondrous is your Son, our Savior, Jesus. And as we gather for worship, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving for the beauty that surrounds us in this part of creation, for the colors that astound us, and even as the leaves change color, we are given opportunity to see things that we perhaps haven't seen. So we give you thanks, God, that we live in this part of creation. And as we give that thanks, we also say thank you that in this part of the world, things are calmer. Even though we live in the midst of an election, elections are reasonably peaceable events. We are not challenged and chastised, threatened as we go to vote, and we give you thanks. As we remember our neighbors and friends in Florida, that as they continue to clean up and discover what losses there are after a couple of hurricanes, 
We pray that we can reach out and help in whatever ways we can. And at the same time, are thankful for the rather peaceable climate of this part of the world. In the midst of our thanks, we remember that wars continue. In Ukraine, in Israel, in Lebanon, and Syria, and pray that however we understand the Prince of Peace, that peace might be accomplished. And we pray for our families, those who are singing and dancing at new relationships, new possibilities, new jobs, new opportunities, and those who are perplexed about health care whether it be physical or mental, those who are perplexed about the unfolding journey of humanity to discover who we are in a complex, in a complex world of understanding our human nature. We give thanks that here at Quispam, the work has and continues to be done on being affirming and welcoming and delightfully hospitable group of folks. And pray your spirit continues to guide that work. And as we gather and have our hearts joined in prayer, we remember Sylvia and family, Kyle and Crystal and Jeff, the Smith family, Ken and Arlene, Jim and Heather, Hillary and Anne and Earl, Pat and Barb and Leslie and family, Linda and Dawn and Betty and Dan and Leah, Paul and Carol and Pat, Rachel and Bill, Archie and Anne, Shanex and friends, Anna, Mark and family and Stephen. May your spirit tend to all of their needs whether they be joys and celebrations, or grieving, or pondering. We know that your spirit tends to their needs. And may you be with us in these Thanksgiving days, and open us to give thanks. Be with us, God, journey with us. Open us to possibility, and cause us to lead with love. For this we pray in the name of Jesus, who calls us to pray when we gather to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as we gather to sing our closing hymn, my words of thanks are to, to Heather and to, to Stephen for uh, leading in worship today, for you for being here, whether you be here in person uh, or on Zoom, and, and to Heather, uh, we tried to cobble together a, uh, a service and a PowerPoint that, that, would, that would be wonderful, and uh, thank you. We, uh, uh, so I'm thankful for, for, those, for, that, for all of that. So we plow the fields and scatter. Uh, it's also 520 in our Voices United. <laughs> and scatter the good seed on the ground. For it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. You've been the snow in winter, the warm
want to smell the green, the breezes and the sunshine, and soft refreshing rain. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. <coughs> your children you give us daily bread all good things around us are sent from heaven above we thank you God O oh holy God for all your love we thank you then O oh maker for all things bright and the gifts we offer for all your love in parts and what from us you long for our humble thankful hearts all good gifts around are sent from heaven above Be in the world as those who do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. And may the blessing and thanksgiving of God, Creator, Christ, Spirit, be with you and tend to you this day forevermore. Amen and amen. Too. Wherever you may go, 